I, sh I should uh, clarify that I'm not actually going to be speaking much about the media. I'm going to be speaking more about uh, free speech generally um, because... Uh, I'll just wait. Because I'm not sure if you've been aware, but for the last three years, as far as I'm concerned, we seem to have been in the middle of, of something which I call the, the free speech wars, of which there has been um, a number of prominent skirmishes over the last few years. Uh, we've uh, had the Andrew Bolt trial. We had the battle over the exposure draft of the anti-discrimination bill, which defined discriminatory behaviour as including that um, behaviour which might offend or insult someone on a uh, protected basis, such as uh, gender or race. Uh, we've had, um, Jonathan's alluded to it, we've had the battle over media reform, which um, he's just been talking about, and then the term speech outrages are really just, I'm referring here to, I suppose, the intermittent explosions largely emanating from social media of outrage over particular things people have said. So I want to start off by having a look at some of the combatants in this war. And like any war, you need your martyr. And, you know, you're Martin Luther King, so I'm going to start off with that person. <laughs> um, of course, this is Andrew Bolt who was found to have breached the Race Discrimination Act um, in late 2011. The relevant acts were the publication of two articles in the Herald Sun um, about the self-identification of lighter-skinned Aboriginal people. Um, the article was found to have breached Section 18C and that it offended, insulted, humiliated and intimidated people on the basis of their race. And this was his reaction. Um, as you can see, his right to free speech was severely curtailed. Um, a front page article with big letters in Australia's best-selling newspaper. Um, is something kind of strange about screaming, I've been silenced. <laughs> now, he has many backers in this freedom campaign. Uh, one of the most prominent has been um, the Institute of Public Affairs, the IPA, the free market think tank, which has started, I'm not sure how old it is, but started this uh, website, um, Freedom Watch. If you don't know the IPA, you may know that they have um, a large supply of clean-cut, articulate young men who have somehow taken over the ABC. Um, but this is the, the logo of their site, Freedom Watch, where they vigilantly watch over threats to freedom. And they don't discriminate, it's fine if you're a corporation. Now, um, this is an invitation to their very recent uh, 70th anniversary dinner. The voice of freedom since 1943, master of ceremonies was Andrew Bolt and the main speaker was Rupert Murdoch. And when I saw Rupert Murdoch, it got me thinking, where have I seen, just as an aside, where have I seen Freedom Watch before? I remember it was this guy, this uh, one Judge Napolitano on Rupert Murdoch's favorite television channel, which is Fox News in the United States. And just as an aside, there's actually been some research done on the effect of certain television watching on knowledge of politics. And it turns out that Fox News is actually bottom of that list. Um, you, you know less about political facts if you largely watch Fox News. <laughs> What's actually more remarkable is that you know less, is that Fox News actually came below those people who don't watch any news at all. <laughs> So the implication is you'll know less about political reality if you watch Fox News than if you live in a cave. <laughs> but I might just move on to another, um, I suppose a surprising intervention. This is former High Court Judge Justice Callanan, who I thought his intervention over the discrimination bill was quite spectacular. Um, according to The Australian, he called for the community to rise up against the bill. I, don't, I, I just had visions of mass protests of people just running around randomly offending people. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be what he meant. But that's one side, the freedom fighters. On the other side, we have former Attorney General Nicola Roxon, um, and she defended the doomed provision in the, in the anti-discrimination bill for so long that the whole thing ended up being ditched. Uh, with media reform, the arch-villain was uh, Minister Stephen Conroy, and we have here the fairly understated cover of the Daily Telegraph, um, comparing him to Stalin Mao, Kim Jong-un, and so on. But the real villain, the real villain is these guys. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and one of the leaders of this insidious human rights movement is the so-called Australian Human Rights Commission, which is led currently by Professor Gillian Triggs, and she's particularly suspect because she, she used to be a female international lawyer. Um, now, the IPA has called for the abolition of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Uh, Shadow Attorney General George Brandis has taken a softer approach. Um, he's raised instead the idea of appointing a new commissioner, a freedom commissioner, to make sure that so-called human rights legislation doesn't interfere too much with our freedoms. And you'll be pleased to know that he's already had one applicant. Um, Janet Albrechtson, um, uh, everybody's favourite News Limited columnist. So that's the combatants, and so I may now turn to some analysis of, uh, of all of this. Um, the version of free speech that is being pushed by um, groups like, I suppose, most of News Limited, the IPA, is an absolutist version, one that permits of very few limits. It's, it's much closer to the US version of free speech um, which itself does permit a very few limits, rather than the international human rights version where free speech is balanced against other rights, it is not supreme. For example, free speech and privacy are um, equal under the, uh, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, under the European Convention, and so on. Now, this is a liberal, libertarian view of human rights, and it's very suspicious of any government intervention of any sort, which interferes with one's personal autonomy and one's moral independence. Um, and furthermore, there is a belief that uh, government intervention is inherently oppressive, um, or, and or it's not really for the government to get involved in our moral autonomy and preferences as to what we think and what we want to say. Um, it is also argued that government is inherently inefficient, um, why introduce cumbersome regulation and courts, which Jonathan's just been talking about, into human life unless it is absolutely necessary? Um, and this libertarian view tolerates only a very narrow scope for human rights. They're all negative rights, that is, rights which are freedoms from government intervention. And so positive government intervention, such as regulation, such as Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, um, such as even facilitating free speech with government initiatives, these are all suspect. And so, for example, the IPA um, has gone on record saying it would like the ABC to be broken up and tendered out, um, you know, the ABC which is currently, of course, government funded. This is a free market approach to free speech. And, of course, um, the IPA is a free market think tank. It cam campaigns fiercely against government intervention in markets, for example, um, such as with the plain packaging legislation for tobacco. And this is part of a broader argument that the market is a much safer and more effective indicator and distributor of rights and duties than, um, than governments. Uh, the free market approach to free speech could, for example, be applied to the media, that just leave it to the media, the, the market, to regulate media standards rather than have them um, otherwise interfered with by governments. Um, the problem with this free market approach, though, is that it doesn't take much account of existing power relations. It's, it's fine for those who are powerful or who have the best opportunities, but it takes no account of the idea that certain viewpoints um, don't attract the attention of the commercial media. So um, I believe there is, a, there is a real need for strong state broadcasters such as the ABC and SBS. Um, as another example, hate speech prohibitions, um, especially against historically oppressed minorities, can have a serious silencing effect on the members of the hated groups, um, which often tend to be those very same historically disadvantaged groups. And of course, at worst, it can provoke violence against those groups. And so, I would argue that the libertarian approach to human rights can verge on being a Darwinian approach that really equates with human rights for the strong. It takes a lot of notice of freedom. It takes some notice of dignity, especially the dignity of the speaker, but only some of the listeners. The dignity of the taxpayer, certainly, but not much focus at all on equality. And I just draw your attention to some other threats to free speech which haven't attracted 
um, as much of a war from, from the combatants that, um, that I mentioned. Um, well, we have had, I mean, the first, the first example is not a great one because I guess it hasn't been successful, but we've had and we, ha we are having ongoing lobbying attempts by content providers, particularly in the United States, including News Corporation, which of course, well, actually now it's two companies, but including what was the single entity News Corp, um, to introduce very restrictive intellectual property restrictions to the internet to bolster their proprietorial rights, but at the expense of the right to free speech and freedom of information on the internet. In Queensland, the parliament has introduced a law which requires trade unions to hold a vote of members when they wish to conduct a campaign, um, which, uh, a campaign which, uh, uh, which would cost over $10,000. To be fair, the IPA has criticised criticized this law. At, at one level, this law introduces greater transparency into the workings of unions. But at another level, it clearly muzzles free speech. I mean, a ballot of union members is itself ex extremely expensive. I'm not sure how much it costs, but it could possibly cost more than $10,000 every time they want to run sort of ca a campaign, which has in fact been a traditional role of unions. The next one was alluded to by uh, the Attorney General this morning that New South Wales has introduced new funding guidelines for community legal centres. It prohibits the recipients from conducting political advocacy against, against existing laws and even from lobbying, so even from closed doors lobbying for changes in the law. Even less attention, in my view, I confess I haven't been in the country, but it seemed to me there was very little attention to the next, the second last um, example there. Um, this is a policy aimed squarely at academics, and particularly one academic, uh, one Jake Lynch from the University of Sydney. Jake Lynch is a supporter of the boycotts, divestments and sanctions movement. And uh, late last year, I think it was, he refused to work with an Israeli academic on a particular project because of his support for BDS. And for that decision, he received criticism from both sides of politics. But the opposition, the LNP has now upped the ante. It is said that under its government, government funds cannot go to a person or institution who supports BDS. We're not talking about activities which promote BDS. We're talking about people who, whether they actually support it or not. Now, if this policy was to come in, of course, the LNP would have to be elected first, but if they are serious, that would mean that they would have defunded Stephen Hawking who famously, the famous um, scientist who earlier this year boycotted a conference as a protest against Israeli policies in the, um, well, is the Israeli occupation. Now, regardless of what one might think of the, BDS, um, pol uh, of the BDS movement, this policy, as announced by the LNP, Liberal National Party, is in my view an outrageous attack on academic freedom and freedom of expression. And yet, largely, there has been silence. In fact, News Limited, which is so concerned about free speech, it described the ALP's failure to match the policy as squibbing the challenge. Now, I'm sure when it comes to the, um, the aid to CLCs and even this BDS policy, that um, I'm suspecting that the IPA and News Limited don't see threats of withdrawal of government funding as a free speech issue. Indeed, given their view on the proper role of government, they're probably not particularly fussed about the withdrawal of government funding generally. But there are certain constituencies which simply don't attract significant private sector funding. Australia, for example, just simply doesn't have the same level of philanthropic funding like you find, for example, in the United States. In fact, no one in the United States is quite unique that way. Community legal centres work on behalf of the legal rights of disadvantaged people. In the absence of significant private funding, they need government funding. And so should they therefore, should the price therefore be muzzling them? Should they not try to advocate and change laws that they believe are unfair to the disadvantaged? Can they not even lobby? Or is lobbying just, you know, limited to rich people? The New South Wales government argues that it wants public money to be spent on the CLC's core business. That is to provide legal assistance to those in need rather than on the add-on activity of political activism. But political activism can be prevention rather than cure in highlighting unjust laws and practices that simply shouldn't exist. And so I would argue it is a part of the core role of CLCs. And as for the proposal on BDS, 
government funding is essential for academic promotion these days. I mean, you know, it's, it's now the, the biggest thing in academia is you need to get grants you, and uh, the, um, I, I guess there are, other, there are other sources but the government and the Australian Research Council are the most obvious ones. And so any academic that cares about his or her career would have to be silent on his or her support for BDS. And so if that person boycotted an Israeli event, they couldn't say why, which actually deprives the boycott of any meaning at all. I should report um, one positive thing, which was also mentioned by the Attorney General this morning, and that is the Not-for-Profit Freedom to Advocate Act, which, um, uh, which was passed earlier this year, under which Commonwealth bodies are forbidden from inserting clauses in funding contracts that ga gag non-governmental non organisations from engaging in advocacy. Now, finally, I want to turn to one of the key battles in these wars, what I've called the battle over offence. After all, the battle over the Anti-Discrimination Act focused on the clause which included causing offence and therefore offensive speech within the definition of prohibited discrimination. And to be fair, here I agree, I agree in many aspects with, some, with a lot of the criticisms. There simply is no human right not to be offended, not on a racial ground, not on a sexist ground or a religious ground or whatever. There is no human right. Offence falls far short of hate speech. And in fact, some of the most important speech in history was once deemed to be offensive. And so personally, I think it was very wrong for that clause to be included in the anti-discrimination bill, um, though I'm not sure it necessitated abandoning the entire bill, which um, I know bits were then inserted into the Sex Discrimination Act, but the, the general consolidation, in fact, um, didn't happen. I also think that Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act goes too far. To repeat, it prohibits speech which offends, insults, humiliates or intimidates on the basis of race. Now, Andrew Bolt was deemed to have, um, his, his articles were deemed to have uh, breached all of those provisions, okay, that it in fact did all four things. Now, there are defences in Section 18D, but for me, the level is set too low at offends and insults. And so for, for, for me, I don't think that um, things that offend and insult should need to have a defence. They're not nice, but you can't legislate niceness. Um, I wouldn't therefore support a complete repeal of Section 18C, but I would support a repeal of much of it. Now, talking of offensive speech, I want to just, as the last thing, it's... Um, Moving away from law and more, I guess, more into society. And I want to just talk about these sort of so-called um, uh, free speech outrages that I've referred to. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that in many ways, social media, which I'm clearly quite active on, it has a downside, which I call the intolerant water cooler. And um, I want to just turn to some of the casualties, if you like, of, um, of uh, people getting angry uh, on social media and other places about what people have said. Um, clearly, there's um, Alan Jones, who uh, attracted much fury over his comment that Julia Gillard's father had died of shame. Uh, the radio station, for a time, ran his show without any advertising, and I'm not sure, I actually doubt they've got all the sponsorship back um, that they lost, and they probably won't. Um, there was Eddie Maguire, who uh, had a complete brain fade or worse when he repeated a insult, a racial insult against the Swans football player, Adam Goods. Uh, Maguire offered to fall on his sword, but he was allowed to keep his job and his position at the football club, uh, at the Collingwood Football Club. And then you have Howard Sattler, a shock jock from Perth, who asked Prime, then Prime Minister Gillard if her partner, Tim Matheson, was gay. This was based on the idea that all male hairdressers are gay. And he actually was sacked for that. Now, lest or you think all these casualties are on the right, um, I mean, I'm not really sure where Eddie Maguire <laughs> fits in the political spectrum. Um, I'll just remind you of some other ones. There was um, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Larissa Berendt, who tweeted, made an unwise tweet against another Indigenous leader. This led the Australian newspaper to publish an extraordinary amount of stories in the seven days that followed on the basis of this tweet, very few of which were related to the tweet, and it called for Berendt to be removed from a particular federal body. And then there was, um, to be frank, a genuine mistake from human rights lawyer Julian Burnside. Um, 
uh, he sent out a tweet which seemed to imply certain things about Tony Abbott. And um, I can assure you it was inadvertent. It wasn't actually about Tony Abbott, but it was very obvious why people would think it was. And so there was a thunder of condemnation and people you know, calling for him for a defamation suit and so on. Now, why do I mention these things? I guess I confess to some disappointment, in fact, a lot of disappointment over the tendency of social media towards you know, e extreme judgment, that this gigantic water cooler is actually pretty intolerant. It's ready to pounce and tear someone apart, and that outrage occurs across the spectrum. Now, in my view, Alan Jones and Eddie Maguire certainly deserved opprobrium for what was a cruel statement by Alan Jones and a completely boneheaded one from Eddie Maguire. Um, Eddie, I won't go through the details of Eddie Maguire's statement. I can say, I mean, he, he came out with a justification of why it wasn't actually racist. I could see that it was possible, and I don't know what he was thinking. I don't even know why he would say that. But it could be possible that he just said something extremely dumb. And I don't know about you, but I do not underestimate the human capacity to say something very, very dumb. What worries me, I mean, I don't mind people, I mean, if you say something dumb, then wear the consequences. That's fine. What worries me about the reaction is the way that people were calling for them to be sacked. And it seems like the default these days, for many, is for, offense, for, you know, for something they find offensive is to call for that person's head, to call for them to lose their livelihood or some aspect of it. It's not immediately to challenge their words. It's not to win the battle ideas by maybe getting their audiences to turn them off. I'd have no problem if you know, Alan Jones lost his job because no one listened to him anymore. But it's to just go straight to getting them sacked because, I mean, we know this can work both ways, that it's just going to ramp up if, everyone get, you know, if people get sacked immediately. And another thing that worried me about the Alan Jones saga was the way people were lobbying advertisers to get him sacked because in my view, one of the greatest threats to truly free speech, in the media at least, is constraints by advertisers. And in fact, the Media Watch program on this week, on Monday, uh, was, it wasn't so much about advertiser constraints, but it was certainly about advertiser power over the media. Now, we have no idea how much content is censored or altered or um, doctored, if you like, to suit the interests of advertisers. I suspect it could be a lot. And so, I think to lobby advertisers and to kind of encourage them to be policing, policing the content, I'm just not sure that's a very healthy thing. It seems to legitimise that power. Um, having said that, I might be just being too utopian here. The horse may well have bolted and advertisers have a lot of power, that's just the way it is, and therefore why not try and harness that power toward, towards your own cause? So I concede that. But I did find that that campaign about, about Jones's advertisers was conceding that advertisers have a proper role in policing content, and I'm, I'm actually not comfortable with that. Um, having said that, I actually confess that personally, I mean, these issues are not easy. I personally put Howard Sattler in a different boat. I'm not actually unhappy he was sacked, but I'm not sure that I'm right in saying that. I mean. What he did, I guess, I just think it was so un it was incredibly rude to an interviewee questioning the genuineness of her relationship. But on, at the same time, he is a shock jock, and so I'm not sure that matters. I mean, he was, in a way, doing what he, he was employed to do. And so I'm afraid that um, the social media water cooler is, for me, it can be an utterly unforgiving place. And I understand the anger at offensive remarks, and I guess they are normally, des they are often deserved. But I'm disappointed with how schadenfreude and smugness can rule on social media, and that there is very little acknowledgement that there but for the grace of God go I, that maybe one day you or I might say something incredibly dumb. Uh, finally, I'm not going to get into this, I didn't expect I would because there's um, not time, but I just wanted to flag that there is an international dimension to the free speech wars. Uh, including a massive battle over freedom of information, um, epitomised by you know, the sagas over WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden, as well as an international battle over offensive speech, um, epitomised by, well, by the movie and the reaction to it, the YouTube movie, um, Innocence of Muslims. So I just flagged that, but um, I, won't, uh, I won't get into it. Um, so thank you.